Let's continue to unravel the tangled web that is the franchise affair. No way to say this informally, I'm afraid. I have a warrant for the rest of your clients, Mrs. Augustine Sharp and her daughter, Marion. Inspector Grant, I'm not trying to minimise the crime you're accusing my clients of, but it is a misdemeanour. It's not a felony. Now, why do you need a warrant for their arrest? Surely you could serve them with a summons to appear. In cases where the crime is aggravated, and my superiors take a grave view of the present one, a warrant's issued. The girl was missing for over three weeks, Mr Blair, and she'd been badly knocked about. But what do you gain from an arrest? There's no question of my clients not being there to answer the charge. And they're not likely to commit a similar offence. I'm sorry, but my superiors have decided upon a warrant. Your clients will be up at the police court on Monday. I'm sorry, do sit down. Thank you. I take it this means you have fresh evidence. Conclusive, we think. May I know what it is? Of course. We found the man who saw Betty Kane getting into the car at the bus stop. Getting into a car. Very well, getting into a car. She really did miss that Larborough Birmingham coach. Our witness says it passed him about half a mile down the Sherrill Road. A few moments later, when he came within sight of the bus stop, she was still there waiting. He saw the car stop by her, saw her get in, saw it drive away. But not who was driving? No. We also have a girl from a local farm who used to clean for the Sharps. She'll swear that she heard screams coming from the attic in April. At precisely the time Betty Kane says she was held prisoner. This girl from the farm, um, it's not Rose Glynn by any chance. Yes, it is. Did she volunteer the information about the screaming? Not to us, no. She spoke about it to friends. But we have evidence that she was talking about these screams even before we knew about Betty Kane. Bob. You've been very frank. I'd like to be equally frank. Your superiors have no knowledge of local conditions. Now, thanks to this rubbish, feeling in Milford against the Sharps is running very strong. If you arrest these women, you'll have to keep them in custody until Monday. If the franchise is left unoccupied, it'll be a wreck within 24 hours. Have your superiors thought of that? There is something in what Mr. Blair says. When word of an arrest gets about, there's bound to be trouble around the house. Mm. Why didn't Grant come with us? You don't need Scotland Yard to serve a summons. That's like asking a top surgeon to open a boil. He's not a happy man. You've done him out of an arrest. No, I think it's more than that. He seems to take a very personal interest in executing that warrant. Look, uh, keep this to yourself, all right? Grant's well known at the Yard for his good judgment of people. I think he believed more in these franchise women than he did in the girl. Now that his famous judgment's been proved wrong, he can't forgive the Sharps for pulling the wool over his eyes. charging us with this thing? I'm afraid so, Miss Sharp. But why? Why now? Inspector Hallam has come to serve a summons on us, Mother. A summons? To appear at the police court on Monday morning to answer a charge of abduction and assault. Do we have to accept this? I'm afraid there's no alternative. 
I think I ought to tell you, Miss Sharp, in case he doesn't, that but for Mr. Blair here, that would have been a warrant for your arrest. You have him to thank for the fact you'll be sleeping in your own beds tonight and not in a police cell. How are you going to get back to Milford? Oh, well, walk down to the main road and wait for a bus. Sorry about that. Oh, thanks for the vote of confidence. They're luckier than they deserve getting you. Can you be ready with your defence by Monday? With all the defence my clients have, I could be ready by tea time. I'm afraid I've been rather ungracious. The summons was a shock. Miss Sharp, I'll put this as tactfully as a country lawyer knows how. We don't seem to have been getting on very well, do we? Would you rather I bowed out? I'd rather we called a truce. A truce, then? I don't think we could be better served by anyone else. I don't suppose anybody else would be fool enough to try. I could kill that bloody girl when I think of what she's done to us. I rather look forward to going into court. If only to see Miss Betty Kane discredited. Discredited in court? You got one tiny piece of evidence for us, not one. And evidence just blossoming for that brat. Proof has a validity of its own. Well, Dreyfus didn't <coughs> find it very valid. Oh, he did in the end. Frankly, Mother, I don't look forward to a life in prison waiting for truth to demonstrate its validity. Well, what happens now? You'll appear in front of the bench on Monday. Since we have no adequate defence, you'll be committed for trial. I'll ask for bail. That would at least mean you could stay here until the Assizes at Norton. What I don't understand is why this is happening now. Because the police believe they have the corroborative evidence they need. They found a man who will swear he saw Betty Kane picked up from the bus stop. And the girl who used to work here will swear she heard screams coming from your attic. Now that is much more serious, I'm afraid. Rose Glynn? Didn't you tell me she only came here for a few days last year to help you move in? Yes. And yet here she is saying she heard screams coming from your attic in April. Or was she here in April? Yes, she was. We had a burst pipe under the sink and we called her in to clear up the mess. She was here for a few hours one afternoon. Oh dear. Bit of a facer, isn't it? Yes, I'm afraid it is. Well, you really are faced with the possibility that we may have been lying. Oh, it's Rose Glynn that's the liar. And a thief. She stole Marion's watch. I only noticed it had gone after she'd left that afternoon. I'd taken it off in case it got wet. It wasn't the first thing she'd stolen. When she came here last year, things began to disappear. Some silver from my purse, a pair of Marion's stockings. We needed her so badly, I'm afraid we turned a blind eye. The watch was different. My father gave it to me. Did you speak to the girl about it? <laughs> we went over to the farm the next morning. Silly of us, really. Knew we wouldn't get it back. No, but how did she react? Well, she denied it, of course. Went very pink and flounced a bit. Oh, nonsense. She went beetroot red and bridled like a turkey cock. She's a bad lot, that girl. But it's largely thanks to her. The police think they've got this case tied up with red ribbon. I wish you told me about Rose Glynn last week. Might have given us time to... Establish a prior link between her and Betty Kane. I'm sorry. At least that would explain how Miss Kane comes to know so much about the inside of this house. I just didn't think it had any relevance. Is there anything else you haven't told me? Oh, we do have just one tiny confession to make. At least Mother does. About the dog. <laughs> 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 No, I'm sorry, old boy. You've lost me. The dog, Neville. It's a spaniel. What of it? Betty Kane says she was whipped with a dog lead. The Sharps tell the police they don't have a dog, which is true. They don't anymore. But that spaniel was run over in London three years ago. But they hung on to the dog lead. It's tricky. What is trickier? The old lady thought she'd save everyone a lot of bother by burning the evidence. Robert, do you believe Betty Kane's story? Do you? No. I think the Sharps are telling the truth. You, Neville? You sure you don't believe the Sharps because you want to? 
an ex-policeman, would you say? Ramsden? Mr. Ramsden? Robert Blair. My partner, Neville Bennett. It might be an idea if we went back to the office. The place is crawling with press, I'm afraid. Very sensible, Mr. Blair. I should think, Mr. Blair, on the whole, all things considered, this young lady from Birmingham is going to be wonderful in the witness box. Yes, I'm afraid you're right, Mr. Ramsden. Now, let me see if I've got all this quite right in my head. We're talking about two lonely women, not very well off, saddled with a large, isolated house. One of them's too old for housework, the other one hates it. According to the police, they go mildly potty and capture someone to be their servant. It's their bad luck. The person they capture happens to be a blameless schoolgirl, because everyone is going to accept her story rather than theirs. So I'm sure you'll recall a parallel case, Mr. Blair, where everyone believed the nice little girl's story and then were very thoroughly led up the garden path. A parallel? When? Uh, 1754, Mr. Bennett, to uh, Rex versus Canning. Oh. The nature of alibis hasn't changed much in two centuries, Mr. Bennett. So you think Betty Kane's story is an alibi? A oh, complete invention from start to finish, I'd say. Uh, something to do with the eyes, you see. The eyes? Well, it's a result of my observation over 20 years as an inquiry agent. Uh, the eyes are set wrong. Look as if they belong to different faces. Always a sign of a plausible liar, that. Uh, or a murderer. Uh, I'd say she was oversexed, too. Now, it seems to me, Mr. Blair, that what you need to know is whether Betty Kane ever met this girl Rose Glynn in Larborough when she was on holiday. Absolutely. But it's even more important to find out where Betty Kane actually was when she said she was at the franchise. Yes. Well, in that case, we'd be better off forgetting Monday and trying to turn up evidence in time for the assizes. Uh, do you want me to start checking airports and travel agents? No, there's no point. She hadn't got a passport. She could have travelled on someone else's, sir. Huh? It's a wife, you mean? She's only 15. It's those eyes, Mr. Blair. Oversexed. There's bound to be a man in it somewhere. Excuse me, please. Uh, I must change trains. You must change trains at crew. I've told it in my long Thank you. Thank you. It is hot, is it not? I think perhaps today is the day you have your summer. <laughs> to stand you wasted in the garage not a very professional job but it'll have to do for now saw enough of this stuff in Italy not used to most things out there partisans yank transport even the bloody eye ties never got used to slogans on walls though got a phobia from slogans on walls are you uh, leaving one of your boys out here tonight what for You've had there a little bit of fun? I'm not happy about them being in that house alone. It's like a beleaguered fortress. I'm not happy about it either, but they simply refuse to be moved. Well, if Hallam hasn't got the force to deal with it, perhaps one of us should volunteer to sleep there at night. I called in at the franchise this evening. What for? I saw Marion rang the office after you left. Wanted some shopping done. They haven't been out of the house since Monday, you know. I think they were getting a little bored with apples and cold ham. After what I overheard in the bank this morning, I'm quite sure the milkman won't be calling at the franchise anymore. Those poor women. 
It's a bit of a sea change, isn't it? Last week it was those people, now it's poor women. They're not at all my cup of tea, Robert. But in my opinion, anyone in danger of going to prison deserves compassion. I had a lovely time last night. I found a book on torture and stayed awake till two o'clock choosing which one to use on Betty Kane. I'm afraid most people seem to think she's been persecuted enough already. Have you seen this week's parish magazine? I suppose the vicar's in his element. I've never seen him so pleased with himself. I'm not sure his sermon last Sunday wasn't an incitement to violence. Well, all criminals, according to that idiot, are persecuted angels. I suppose the congregation was full of reporters. I don't know about that. It was certainly full of Mildred Pinner and her awful cronies. I'm sure that woman approves of lynching. She's doing her best to provoke one. Oh, God, listen to this. There are occasions when violence is but a symptom of a deep social unrest and insecurity. And it is not to be marvelled at that some of the more passionate spirits are moved to personal protest. I could brain the bloody man. It was if we didn't have enough to cope with without that idiot putting in his six penneth. I'm really beginning to hate this town. You won't be happy until the sharps are doing hard labour. It's bad enough. They should have to go into the dock. I think we should forget about the magistrate's court. Bank everything on the assizes. Forget about it. It'll be a public spectacle. So, the shorter time they spend in the dock, the better. No, we'll listen to the police evidence, reserve our defence, and make an application for bail. Well, we may get a dismissal. We don't want a dismissal. A half decision like that isn't going to help the Sharps at all. We need to discredit Betty Kane in open court. Do you think Kevin McDermott could be lured down here to defend them? Wasn't he at school with you? We could try. Well, even if he's interested, he'd probably just prime one of his dog's bodies to do it. I'd better be making tracks. Thank you for a splendid meal. You can do better than cold meat and boiled potatoes, you know. Just give me more notice next time. Do you know what I found her doing this evening? Chopping firewood. 10,000 nitwits like Mildred Pinner have nothing to do but sit back and have the polish on their predatory nails changed. And Marion chops wood. It's obscene that that woman should be wasting her vitality on household drudgery. Absolutely, never. She ought to be hacking her way through jungles or storming barricades. You're very tart tonight, old man. Am I? Pure Angostura. Good night. Oh, good night, dear. Good night, Kathleen. I'll see you tomorrow in a more fragrant mood, I hope. Good night. It's no longer just a business affair, is it? What's really troubling you, my dear, isn't going to be resolved in the courtroom, is it? I'm so sorry. I had no idea until tonight that you felt that way about me, Sharp. I didn't realise it myself until just now. Imagine me, jealous of Neville. <laughs> Keep on saying your prayers, won't you? Nothing short of a miracle can save them now. The trouble with you, my dear, is that you haven't enough faith in yourself. She looks about 12 years old, for God's sake. I wonder if she's had any stage offers. Morning. John? Is Grant here? No, not yet. Hello, Bobby, Morning. darling. Good morning. Robert. Do you know, it's a wonder to me how so many people can find so little to do on a Monday morning. Milford High Street must be deserted. Not the usual 
bunch of loafers waiting for the pubs to open. Vultures. Look at the bloody press. They're practically drooling. The papers will have a field day tomorrow. Even if they're discharged, nothing's ever going to compensate them for this circus. Silence in court. This is Augustine Sharp. Miss Marion Sharp. <coughs> Inspector Haller. Two charges, Your Worship. One of unlawful imprisonment and one of assault. Oh. Might we be allowed to sit down again, please? My mother is rather frail. I'm nothing of the sort. I shall remain on my feet for as long as you wish me to remain on my feet. You may sit down. <laughs> Inspector Haller. Mm -hmm. On the night of the 20th of April last, a schoolgirl, Elizabeth Kane, missing from home since the 28th of March, a period of three weeks and three days, was found in a distressed state, badly beaten and bruised and wearing only a thin cotton dress and a pair of shoes. This room is very drab, Miss Tuff. Post-war England is drab, Mr. Hesseltine. And rationed. Where's the boy? In court. Mr. Robert may need errands to be run. And did you mend all the bed linen they brought you? Not that night, no. Why was that? Take your time. Just tell me in your own words. I was too stiff from the whipping she gave me. I mended them the next day, but the old one said my sewing was bad. And I'd have to do it all again or have no food. They starved you? My fingers were cold. I couldn't hold the needle. The old one hit me with a stick and I got blood on the sheets. And that made her worse. She kept hitting me. Now, Betty. Do you recognize the two women in the dark? Yes. Are they the same women who detained and beat you? Yes. Thank you, my dear. Good God, even he succumbed. Mr. Blair, do you wish to cross-examine? Thank you, sir. I have no questions. Do you see what I want for him? It's a nice, ordinary girl. Someone who will give him five children and a round of golf on Sundays. What he wants for himself is this sharp woman. I think that might be the biggest mistake he's ever made. Your boy's not very happy, my darlings. He does need watching over. He will try and help, won't you? Call Rose Glenn. Little slut. Who's that boy? I've seen him before somewhere. It's the Wallace boy. Runs errands for the butcher in Carter's Lane. There was some trouble last year over his motorbike. That's it. He and his cronies were hanging about outside the franchise last week. Take the Bible in your right hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God, the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Give me your full name. wasn't necessary, Miss Glynn. Well, there's screams and screams, aren't there? Screams like when you're on the Big Dipper, 
Another light screams when you get your lip bit. This were a different sort, sort of really scared screaming. You were in the kitchen and you say you heard screaming coming from the attic. I weren't in the kitchen. I mean, you're all going home. And I didn't say the attic, did I? I said upstairs. I heard screaming coming from a long way off, upstairs. And then she came down all la-di-da. You're referring to Miss Sharp? Yeah, her. She told me to go, so I went. I'd have gone even if she'd said stay. Thank you, sir. I have no questions. I've never felt so bloody inadequate, Robert. I don't think we should have given in so easily. I have considerably good faith in a judgment framed outside their hometown. You? We've simply reserved our defence, that's all. What defence? We have two weeks before the trial and no defence whatsoever. You know, that trial is quite extraordinary. In my experience, the true criminal has two unvarying characteristics. Monstrous vanity and colossal selfishness. Betty Kane displayed neither this morning. Your only experience of criminals, Mother, is from detective novels. Thank you for arranging surety for our bail. Well, I don't suppose going to prison these days is any more punitive than a third-rate public school. There's no question of your going to prison. Of course there is, Mr. Blair. Today was only the postponement of the inevitable. We all know that. 